What we're talking about today is the, uh, the equations of motion for the ocean. I'm not going to go derive it from, uh, from a bare minimum. We're going to talk more in hand-waving arguments. Uh, recall from previous lectures examining conservation of mass and scalars in the ocean, this concept of the total derivative, uh, which is an operator like the derivative you're familiar with, but includes in particular the influence of advection on uh, the local value of a quantity. And so Miles uh, gave a very nice analogy looking at an estuary and how gradients and salinity coupled with advection can change locally the value of uh, the salinity. And so we're looking at local rates of change and the influence of advection on these scalar quantities temperature and salinity, for example. Well, what about momentum? Well, momentum is a vector, but we can look at it in terms of three separate scalars in the three coordinate directions, x, y, and z. So we have u momentum in the x direction, y momentum in the y direction, and z momentum, I'm sorry, w momentum in the z direction. Conservation of momentum, in the prior lecture we looked at Newton's second law and first law. Uh, the rate of change of momentum is given by the sum of forces acting on the body. And for that we were primarily focused on fixed blocks where the mass was unchanging, it was a, there were solid bodies. Um, for the ocean we'll be considering uh, a case where the density may change locally in the fluid as we've discussed previously in the class. Um, and we are exa we'll examine Newton's law from a general form for our, a fixed control volume. The rate of change of that momentum, which includes advection, is going to be equal to the sum of the forces acting on the control volume. And the focus of today's lecture is to figure out how to quantify mathematically, how to note mathematically the nature of the forces that act on the fluid. Now mass in the ocean can be written as density times the volume. Let's consider for a second a fixed volume of fluid, uh, fixed in place, and f um, a fixed volume. A fluid may be flowing through this, but the volume is fixed in space. So you can pull volume out of the equation. Um, and we have rho, uh, V times d rho V dt, so that's the rate of change in momentum. Um, and we can write this as being equal to rho V dv dt. How can we do this? Well, we can take d rho v dt and we can expand it. We have the derivative of rho v dt. We can write this as rho dv dt plus b v d rho dt from the chain rule. This quantity is equal to zero along a streamline if we consider the fluid to be incompressible. So this is gone, so essentially we can pull rho outside of, the, um, of this operator under this assumption right here. So we finally have our generic equation of motion for the fluid looks like this, where I've brought the rho v over and put it underneath the right hand side. This is typically how this is written in oceanography. We have the rate of change of what we're calling momentum, and here it's just the velocity. It's, it's actually a unit's velocity, but this is still the momentum equation. And I've pulled this m uh, over to the right here. So we good writing this in terms of force per unit areas. So whereas normally we have units of force for Newton's second law on both sides of the equation, now we have units of acceleration. So we'll be talking in class about forces, these kind of forces, this kind of force, but those forces will all be in units of acceleration. So that is something to get used to and keep, just keep an eye on your units for sure. Now what are these forces? Well there's a couple different types. There's two classes. One are body forces. Body forces act on all the molecules in the water column at the same time. For example, on this box of fluid, gravity acts on every single molecule in that box. Gravity is a body force. Coriolis, which is an apparent or fictitious force, 
that comes from the fact that we're applying Newton's law in a non-inertial coordinate system is also a body force. It acts on every parcel, every piece of fluid in that entire box. Uh, there are other kinds like magnetohydrodynamic forces as well. Surface vo uh, forces act on the surface of your control volume. For example, pressure, which we've already discussed in class, and viscous stresses, which we'll mention today, um, e.g. friction. Um, so there's two different types of forces acting on all the molecules, acting on the surface of the control volume. Gravitational force is probably the easiest to uh, conceptually speaking. The force due to gravity is just simply mass times gravity, written in our fluid mechanical sense, it's rho vg. And if we want to write this as a force per unit mass, or here I've included the prime, which indicates we are using, these are specific forces. They are force per unit mass, so the units are acceleration. I divide it by the mass, or rho v, and I get simply g, which also has units of acceleration in the, the value in the surface of the Earth, so about 9.81 meters per second squared varies a little bit. That's the G that we're familiar with. The forces are vectors. Should this force affect the momentum in all the different coordinates? No, it will not. It will only affect the momentum in the vertical. It will only influence the vertical momentum of the fluid. So we must keep track of the fact that this is a vertical force. It is not a horizontal force in the coordinate system that we use. So strictly speaking, we would write as this, that our force per unit mass due to gravity is negative g k, where k is the unit vector which points up. It is the w direction unit vector, a z direction unit vector, a unit vector having no magnitude, only a direction, and that direction is up. Since the force gravity pulls down, you have a minus sign here. Later, when we reassemble the entire momentum equations, you'll see this show up. We have momentum equations in U, V, and W, but this will only show up in the W momentum equation because it only acts in the vertical. What about pressure? We've talked a little bit about pressure in class, pressure being a force per unit area. It always acts normal to a surface. Pressure always acts orthogonally to a surface. If we have a cube, and we want to consider how does pressure influence the x direction of the flow? How can pressure, a, a difference in pressure, contribute to a change in the x momentum? Now remember, positive pressure implies a negative force when we consider dotting it with the outward unit normal vector. So in this case, we have on the left side of this cube, so we're basically saying this looking at this cube, we're looking at the pressure distribution on it and trying to decide how that pressure distribution might lead to motion to the left or to the right along the x-axis. So pressure on this top face here, because pressure only acts normal to the face, it can only push down on that face. On the bottom it can only push up. On this face right here it can only push into the board and on the back face it only out of the board. So only on the left and right faces can we have pressure contributions that lead to left and right motion. That's the nature of pressure. The pressure force on the left face is P times the face area. Remember force is pressure times area and pressure is force over area. This is the force on the left and the force on the right. We're going to consider a situation where the pressure on the right is the same as the pressure on the left plus a little bit. So the pressure on the right is P which is the same pressure I put on the left plus some delta P. So if we sum the forces in uh, sum the forces in x, the forces due to pressure in the x direction, we have a positive force on the left, trying to push the parcel to the left. We have a negative force on the right, where the pressure there is trying to push the parcel against the x coordinate in the negative x direction. So that is a negative force, and we have negative delta p, delta y, delta z. So the pressure cancels out. The fact that we have the same pressure here and here, those balance. So those are removed from the equation. And the only thing that shows up pressure-wise is this difference in pressure between the right and left face, delta P. It can be negative, could be positive, it doesn't matter. But it just implies there's a difference between the left and right face. Now, 
we want force per unit mass. So let's divide it by the mass of the cube, divide by rho v. The mass the volume of the cube is delta x times delta y times delta z. It's the three side lengths. But remember we have, as force, we had force times the area of the left and right face, and the area of the left and right face is delta y delta z. So we have a delta y delta z in the numerator, and therefore those cancel out. Boom, boom. We're left with minus 1 over rho delta p delta x. So how quickly, so this is what we call the pressure gradient, the pressure gradient. So pressure can lead to force, and that pressure force is proportional to the pressure gradient. Here's force per unit area, is proportional to the pressure gradient. So the pressure is changing more rapidly, that is the same as a um, larger, that can lead to a larger pressure force. If the pressure is not changing at all, delta P over delta X is zero, and we have no force due to pressure. Now why the minus sign? Well, if the pressure is increasing with X, so let's say this is the X direction, and the pressure here is equal to P, and the pressure here is equal to some P plus delta P, a higher pressure, we have higher pressure on the right of the cube than on the left, and it's going to win out. It's going to push it backwards, meaning it moved, the parcel will want to accelerate in the negative direction. Thus we have a minus sign. If the partial P partial X is positive, the pressure is increasing with X, and it's going to tend to move it backwards. So we have a minus sign here. It will lead to a negative acceleration of the block. Now in vector form, the pressure we can do in the other two directions, it's the same math, and we come up with these three terms. They all look the same. For x momentum, we have this term, which we just derived. For y momentum, this term, and for z momentum, this term. So for z momentum, for example, it only depends on the pressure gradient, how pressure is changing in z. We can also write this if we want in vector form. If you go back to the first class, you'll see these two separate notations for the vector form of this particular pressure. When we finish with the momentum equations, you'll see these term, terms in each of the equation. So remember that minus sign. It's very important, otherwise you're going to get the flow going the wrong way. What about a special case of a constant density fluid? Well, let's consider this to be the bottom of the ocean here, the bottom. This dotted blue line is what, I would, what I'll call the mean sea level. That's the sea level in the absence of any sea surface gradients. If the sea surface is just laying flat, there's no tides, there's no wind, there's nothing going on. That's the mean sea level. Now I want to compute the pressure down here at this point. Actually, let me make it at this point right here and this point right here, and we're going to look at that difference in pressure. Pressure on the right is going to be equal, and this is a depth, we'll call this H here. Pressure on the right is going to be equal to rho G times the depth below the free surface, H plus A to R. And pressure on the left is going to be equal to rho g, this is just hydrostatic pressure, h plus eta left. Eta is the height of the free surface above the mean level. So something comes in, tides, wind, it may displace the free surface from an equilibrium flat level, and that um, displacement is a length scale in meters, and it's, um, we usually write it as eta, the height of the free surface, where it's positive up. If it's higher than mean sea level, it is positive. If it is lower than mean sea level, it is negative. Um, so this pressure gradient we can write as minus 1 over rho dp dx. Now we have the two pressures, so we're going to write this as minus 1 over rho delta p over delta x. Now if I subtract pressure left from pressure right, the rho gh appears in both equations and will disappear, the both terms, and will disappear. So I'm only going to be left with the rho g delta eta. So this will be equal to 1 over rho minus 
times rho g times eta r minus eta left. So the only thing that appears in that equation, let me clean it up a little bit here, um, the rows cancel out. So, oops, I lost my delta x. So I have minus uh, g, remember the rows canceled out, times the change in eta divided by the change in distance. So this is the average rate of change, and if we let x delta x go to zero, we get the instantaneous rate of change. We can write this as minus g partial eta partial x. So the, for the case of a constant density flow, and later we'll see that this is actually the case whenever uh, the density, uh, the iso pycnals, the lines of constant density, are parallel to the lines of constant pressure, something we call barotropic simulation. But in, for simplicity, let's just say the density is constant everywhere. In that case, the pressure w will change from here to here. I'm sorry, from here to here, rather. Even though there's pressure on both sides due to the depth from the mean sea level, because it's the same on both sides, it doesn't make a difference in the pressure gradient. The gradient comes from differences of pressure, and those differences in pressure are only due to differences in the displacement of the free surface. We consider hydrostatic pressure, the pressure is at distance, eta, times rho g. And now we've divided the force by rho, so the rho has disappeared, and we've ended up with the pressure gradient in this constant density situation looking like this. The pressure gradient depends on the gradient of the sea surface height. If the sea surface is changing um, with x, then we will have a pressure gradient uh, due to that, and the parcel of fluid may undergo acceleration due to that. So in this case here, because the sea surface is higher on the left than it is on the right, just in my picture, the pressure, if I'm a parcel of fluid, say right here, the pressure it's feeling on the left face is greater than the pressure on the right because the water is higher in the left face than it is on the right. That higher pressure on the left wants to push the parcel to the right. Now let's look at our equation down here. Here we have minus g times the sea surface slope. The sea surface slope, the sign of it, is also negative. It is decreasing with x, so partial a to partial x is less than zero, and there's a minus sign there, and you multiply those two signs together, you get a positive number. So the pressure gradient, the force associated with the sea surface slope, the pressure gradient, is positive. It will tend to accelerate this parcel of fluid in the positive x direction. So that's important to get a sense of what a slope, the direction that a sea surface slope tends to push a water parcel. Um, you can uh, keep that in mind, but, but connect it back ultimately to the hydrostatic pressure field that's associated with that sea surface slope. We will return to this concept uh, at least twice more during the semester because it's very important. Coriolis. <clears throat> now, when discussing, um, we spent some time with Newton's second law and this idea of reference frames, and in the in-class problem we studied the a funny example of trying to make observations from an accelerating move, uh, reference frame, in this case an accelerating Zamboni. <coughs> and we found that Newton's laws seemed to not work from that coordinate system. We were observing the hockey puck slowing down um, even though no forces were active on the system. Now the issue was we were doing Newton's laws from a non-inertial reference frame, an accelerating reference frame. And what we had to do is we had to modify Newton's laws to include um, the acceleration of our reference frame in there. And so the, our Newton's law became that the, the second derivative here, x double dot, the second derivative of displacement of the hockey puck was given by the sum of forces on the hockey puck, which happened to be zero, 
um, minus the acceleration in the Zamboni. And this accounted for the acceleration of our reference frame, and thus the observations, even though they appeared strange, matched our modified Newton's laws. Now in the video you would have watched before this, there is a short discussion of a rotating reference frame, the idea that that's also an accelerating non-internal inertial reference frame, and you see the students on a merry-go-round throwing balls to each other, and in a moment you're throwing, trying to throw the ball to the person across from you, but because your reference frame is rotating, that ball tends to curve from your perspective, even though there are no forces acting on the ball. It's the same problem as the Zamboni. That's only because you're in a rotating non-inertial reference frame. The Earth is also a rotating non-inertial reference frame. So in order to use Newton's law in that uh, as we know them, you have to add another apparent uh, force or fictitious force. There's several different ways of describing this. You have to add in a term to account for the rotation of the planet. Now the planet's not so simple as a merry-go-round because it's a sphere. And that means that the amount of rotation varies depending on your latitude. If you were at the equator, it is essentially is an inertial reference frame. The rotation is zero. At the North Pole, it is very much like the merry-go-round. The rotation is the same as the rotation rate of the Earth. So it depends on latitude. So um, we're going to get into that in the next slide. So we have to add, we're going to add in these apparent forces. These are only there because we're applying Newton's laws in our convenient reference frame, which is attached or stapled to the Earth. If we tried to solve fluid mechanics from an inertial reference frame, the celestial reference frame, saying attach ourselves to the North Star, looking down at the planet, it would be very difficult to solve these problems. The only gain we would be is we, would have, we wouldn't have to include this apparent term, which is quite simple to include, so we go in this direction. Um, the omega there is the inertial angular velocity of the Earth, 7.29 e to the minus 5 radians per second. If you convert that to what you might expect the rotation rate of the Earth to be based on a day, 3600 seconds times 24 hours, you will not get the same number, and that's because the Earth is also rotating around the Sun. This was discussed in, I think, the first or second lecture. They're very close, though. So, if we actually compute the Coriolis by direction, you get lots of messy numbers that show up here in the X momentum, in the Y momentum, and in the Z momentum equation. They all have kind of a similar look. They involve twice the angular velocity of the planet. This sine phi, where phi is latitude, so again, at the equator, phi is zero, sine of phi is zero. So these terms are all gone, with the exception of the cosine ones, at the equator. However, you can show that this Z component of the Coriolis is tiny compared to the other terms in the Z equation. For example, the pressure gradient, the gravity, and you can basically ignore them. But then you have some energy problems if you decide to ignore that one term and not the others. Um, so what happens is we cross out these two terms, make sure we don't have any uh, false sources of energy, and we're left with simply these terms here. Now this parameter, uh, 2 omega, sine uh, phi shows up quite a bit, so we give it a name, that is F, that is the Coriolis parameter. Um, it has units of 1 over time, and a good number to remember for F is at mid-latitudes, if you plug in the angular rotation of the Earth and you put in sine of 45 degrees, you get very close to this number right here. It's a very good number to remember. 1e to the minus 4 for mid-latitudes, say for around 45, 40, 50, in that range. You can see here that F will increase in magnitude as you get towards the poles. Also very importantly, in the southern hemisphere where phi is negative, sine of negative 45 degrees, for example, is a negative number. The F is negative in the southern hemisphere. So now we've simplified it to this. Our force per, per mass, so this is apparent force per unit mass, or adding in, dealing with a non-inertial coordinate system. In the U-momentum equation, we have FV. And in the V-momentum equation, it's a minus FU. There's a couple important things to note here. 
The first is the minus sign. It's important to remember the minus sign in the V equation. It's, ve it's very critical. A nice way to remember it is that FU is a mean thing to say to someone. It's a negative thing to say to someone. So there's your minus sign. The other important thing is that in the U momentum equation, you have a V velocity. The V having a parcel of fluid that's moving in the V direction, let's say up towards the North Pole, is going to produce a Coriolis force that influences the X momentum. It's going to want to steer it this way. And we'll cover this more in the next slide, but it's important this cross term effect. V velocity influences the U momentum, and therefore U velocity. And U velocity influences the V momentum, and therefore V velocity. It's a very strange effect, but it's a very important one. So what happens? And we're going to go through this in class. We're going to do lots of different examples, but think about this way. Here's your Earth. Here's a parcel of fluid. It's moving north. It has positive V velocity. A positive V velocity leads to a positive Coriolis force in the U momentum equation, which leads to, which gives it a force in the U direction. It's going to try to steer the parcel to the right. But there's a force applied to the right, and it's going to give some U momentum to that parcel. So we say a deflection. A northward current is deflected east. This is northern hemisphere, mind you. A southern, southward current is deflected west. Eastward is deflected to south. Westward is deflected north. It seems like a lot, but in all these cases, all that's happening in the parcel is it's being deflected to the right of its path. It's like walking along and someone's pushing you on your left shoulder and steering you to the right. In the southern hemisphere, it's the opposite. You're walking along, and someone's pushing on your right shoulder, steering you to the left. And that, from that, you can break down based on which way the parcel's going, which way it's going to deflect. These deflections act at right angles in the instantaneous direction. The deflection force is at right angles. So when I say pushing on your shoulder, I mean pushing sideways to the direction that you're walking. The strength of that Coriolis depends on two things. F, it is stronger at higher latitudes, it is weaker in magnitude at lower latitudes, and it also depends on your velocity. If you're walking faster, you are subject to a stronger Coriolis force. It's proportional to the velocity. Um, it is latitude dependent, so it's zero at the equator. Remember this typical 1e to minus 4 um, units of per seconds at the mid-latitudes. Um, this seems small, but it is not small. Um, we will see later in this, uh, as we start to put some numbers in these things in class, we'll see that the accelerations associated with these typical horizontal motions are tiny. We're used to gravity in the, we, we, when we think about accelerations, we think about gravitational acceleration, 10 meters per second squared. We're not going to see anything near that in the horizontal. We're balancing out tiny accelerations, but at certain scales, the accelerations that come from this Coriolis term will be important. In your bathtub, they won't matter. In your toilet, they do not matter. In the Atlantic Ocean, they are going to matter. And we'll see how scale comes into play. And note, I just put mentioned toilet because of this myth of the Southern Hemisphere um, toilet flushing direction. Uh, also, there's apparently some concern it causes diabetes. The last term is friction, and maybe the most complex term uh, in the equation, because it's a tensor, because friction can act on the face of our box, coming back to our box, friction can act on the faces of this box, um, and leads to a far more complex term than our pressure, where it can only act normal to the box. I like to think of friction from a diffusion point of view, that we're diffusing momentum into the box. So we talked in a lot in class about the diffusion of temperature and how temperature gradients can give rise to flows of temperature, to changes in energy. We looked specifically at conductive heat transfer into the ocean, thinking in terms of heat transfer through the walls of the classroom. So there we had a gradient of some quantity, which could be temperature, but here will be momentum. We had to flow that quantity, we needed a gradient we needed something to carry the fluid, so something to quantify how easily that gradient 
carries uh, the quantity, and that was a conductivity coefficient, thinking of solid materials. It was an eddy diffusivity, a diffusivity when we were thinking about the heat transfer between the ocean and atmosphere. And how much gets flowing through there depends on the size. A bigger window is going to have a bigger heat loss. So this area opening came into it as well. Now how can this lead to changes in a particular control volume? Here's my control volume. So I have fluxes at the left face due to this process, this flow process, and I have a flux at the right face due to the flow process, and if the fluxes are the same, then I do not have any change in here. I will just simply have, say we had higher temperature here, and a medium temperature here, and a low temperature here, and the heat was flowing from here to the medium, but at the same exact rate was flowing to the medium to the low, it's going to stay T medium in here forever. So you need a difference in flow rate between the left and the right, a flux of this uh, diffusion, in this case momentum, in order to, to have changes within the box. So we're looking at a gradient differences, meaning a gradient between the left and right faces. And when we think of momentum, we have Q equals U, and we have these specific terms. Here we're just considering X in this box above. So we're looking at this term right here where Q is U, and that forms the first term um, of diffusion in, in the U momentum. How is the U momentum diffusing through the X face of that box? We have the rate of change of our flux. If that rate of change is zero, as I mentioned before, we don't have a net flux. We don't have a net rate of change due to that. And again, the, the conduit is measured by the vertical, by the uh, eddy viscosity. It's, again, it's linked to turbulence in the ocean. It's how quickly um, properties can be transferred around in the fluid due to diffusion. Um, and often what we do in oceanography is separate it out, such that we have two coefficients, one that works in the horizontal, AH here, and there are different names and nomenclatures all over the place, um, so just be wary of that, but AH in the horizontal, and in the vertical, um, you have KM, sometimes AZ, sometimes AV, uh, in the vertical. That's because due to stratification and other processes, the values of the diffusivity as measured in the horizontal versus the vertical is very different. Um, the horizontal is quite difficult to measure and that is in fact one of the things you, your other professor studies. Um, this basically, uh, whatever, the processes that link to uh, quantifying this. So let's take a simple case to get an idea. We have a three um, we have a three column system. We're thinking about U velocity, so this could be a boundary layer, for example, slow flow down here, a little faster here, a little faster higher up. We're looking at how, uh, specifically looking at the middle box here, and we're thinking, how is the momentum in that box going to change due to diffusion? Let's get an estimate of that. Okay, we only have U varying in the Z. So if you come back to the diffusion terms in our U momentum equation, there's three of them. U is not varying in X, so this is zero, and not varying in Y, so this is zero. We only have this term right here. I only want to get an estimate of this term right here. What is an estimate of this thing? So we're looking at the rate of change with respect to Z, the rate of change in the vertical, of this thing right here. This is the flux of momentum. We have Km du dz. What's an estimate of Km du dz? at this point right here, at the black line right here. So at the top we have this is equal to Km, which is 0.05 times du dz. du dz we can estimate using delta u, the change in u, divided by the distance. The distance between the blocks is uh, 5 meters. So this, at, so looking at the rate of change of this thing, this flux quantity, the flux at the top, let's call it Ft, on that black line, is going to be equal to Km, which is 0.05 times the change in U times 1 minus 0.8 meters per second. We have 1 minus 0.8. 
divided by the distance between them. Uh, excuse me, five meters. And at the bottom, along this face here, the flux at the bottom of that, of that cell, middle cell, is equal to Km, which I've assumed to be constant in this simple example, times the difference in U between here and here, 0 0.8 and 0 0.2, 0 0.8 minus 0 0.2 over 5, excuse my writing here. And now we want, uh, which is, I should say this is equal to, I wrote it on the board here, it's 0 0.006. And this is equal to 0 0.002. Now they're both positive, um, but they are of different magnitude. And now we're going to look at the rate of change of these fluxes with respect to x. So that gives us our final d. So this is a diffusion um, force due to diffusion, but it's force per unit mass, so it's, it's going to be of units acceleration, is going to be Ft minus Fb divided by delta Z. This is an estimate of the rate of change of our flux delta F divided by delta Z, which is going to be equal to 0 0.002 minus 0 0.006 divided by 5 meters which is going to be equal to 0 .0 minus 0 0.0008 meters per second squared. It is negative. The diffusive flux is negative. Now, one way to think of this problem, let me just clean up this little region a little bit here. One way to think of this problem, when you look up here, is these are parcels. They are moving at different speed. Three parcels moving at different speed. Parcels don't just slip over each other. They drag on each other. The dragginess is related to the value here. They drag more if this is a larger number. That's like, you can think of it like a coefficient of friction, although that's a little dangerous. But think of it like a coefficient of friction. Now, the top parcel is moving faster than the bottom, than the middle parcel, but just a little bit, 0.2 meters per second faster. It is trying to speed up the middle parcel. It's going faster, saying, come along, come on with us, let's go. But it's only pulling a little bit because it's only going a little bit faster. The bottom parcel is going much slower than the middle parcel. It's saying, whoa, wait, slow down to my speed. I'm going to slow you down. And it's doing a more effective job because it's going much, much slower. So it's doing a it's having a stronger effect in terms of slowing down the middle parcel than the upper parcel is because the velocity is much less than the middle parcel whereas it's in, in the top parcel is just slightly faster than the middle parcel. Thus we have a negative rate of change of momentum meaning that middle parcel in this simple example will slow down because the bottom parcel is having a stronger effect assuming we're ignoring all the other forces that may be at play. So in this simple example, the only force coming from diffusion and momentum, that momentum in that middle parcel will decrease because of the action of the bottom parcel is stronger than the action of the top parcel, which is linked back to this fundamental uh, equation, which we just estimated right here using these points. And this is um, an example of that. So think intuitively with a simple velocity setup what is going to happen to the parcel. If I had made the bottom velocity equal to 0.6 meters per second such that the velocity gradient between the middle and bottom and middle and top were the same, that means the top is trying to pull, accelerate the middle parcel at the same, with the same strength that the bottom parcel is trying to decelerate the middle parcel, nobody wins out and nothing happens to um, the middle parcel's momentum. And that was the case I mentioned before, we're talking about temperature, this idea that momentum is being transferred uh, from the top parcel to the middle parcel at the same rate as it's being transferred from the middle parcel to the bottom parcel, and therefore the middle parcel's momentum does not change. So it depends on that gradient. 
Our final equations look something like this, and this, these are known as the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. Miles talked about this. This is a conservation of mass term. These are the equations we essentially put together today. The rate of change of u momentum, which again we're writing as velocity because we were able to take the density out of it due to our incompressibility assumption, is equal to the action of the pressure gradient, the Coriolis, and diffusion. The y momentum, uh, which is this v velocity, um, the rate of change of that depends on the forces in the y, which are the y base pressure gradient, the Coriolis, remember negative fu, and our diffusion of v velocity, horizontal and vertical. This should be a W at the bottom here, I apologize. dW dt is equal to the pressure gradient in the vertical. This no Coriolis because we've eliminated it from the vertical. It's too small to care about. But we do have an additional force that occurs in the, ver the effects of vertical momentum, gravity. Gravity is only a vertical force. It only shows up in this third equation. And then we have our diffusion of vertical um, momentum. Now. Pressure's in there, but I don't have a prognostic equation for pressure. I don't have a time-varying equation for pressure. That makes this a very hard system of equations to solve, a challenging one. And we also only have four equations, but we have a ton of unknowns. Pressure, velocities, density, uh, vert uh, horizontal diffusivity, and vertical diffusivity. Now, if we actually wanted to solve these, we'd have to get at, we need more equations, basically. Um, we can get a density from the equation of state, but now we need a way of getting the T and S. We have our um, advection diffusion equations for temperature and salinity, which have advection, diffusion, and potentially source terms. We might have heating or cooling at the surface. And we have salinity with advection and diffusion and um, sources of salinity, maybe precipitation or evaporation, uh, groundwater. Now we have S and T, which we have rho, and what we, what we don't have is a way of getting at our diffusivities, turbulent diffusivities. Those usually come from using a turbulence model. For example, the Meller and Yamada, uh, maybe the best known oceanographic turbulence model, estimates, estimates based on slowly varying um, velocities, temperature, and salinity the amount of turbulence that's occurring in the ocean and uses that to determine what the turbulent diffusivity is. And that is a, a big field of study, this turbulence, idea of turbulence and turbulence modeling.